Good morning. <coughs> it is good to see you today. Boy, between last week when I drove down to Cincinnati and this past week, however, I'd say that I don't think that came out right, but boy, have the leaves changed and are getting really, really beautiful out there. If you haven't noticed, do notice. Uh, a couple of announcements. We will have a brief council meeting after worship. And we won't be super long, I don't expect. On Tuesday night, the bishop's coming to our district. If you would want to carpool with me, I will be going, so let me know. He'll be in Chillicothe at 6.30, so we would need to leave before that. Next Sunday, we have a guest speaker because I will be at an annual conference meeting all day long and an hour drive there and back. I, would not have brought you good energy. So Reverend Jim Graham, who is retired, is going to bring us the message. And also next Sunday is the fifth Sunday offering for the Sabina Area Ministerial Association. November 5th, we will celebrate All Saints Day. We will remember those who have gone before us. I don't think there are any members of our congregation this year, but it's still a good time to remember those who have touched our lives in grace. And then the church conference, I called the DS and said we have a conflicting event at our church the night that you are meeting with Clinton County. Can we please go to Fayette County? And so we are going to Fayette County and it will be Monday, November the 13th to be there at 6 o'clock. I don't really know what his plan is. I hope not much longer than an hour, but I don't, I can't give you promises. We're getting a nice collection of candy back there. If you happen to get some and left it at home, make arrangements with Carl at Trunk or Treat is this coming Saturday from 1 to 4. Or I'm sure you can go help, well, help pass out with them. I never do know why that does that on some occasion. Keeps you awake, I suppose. And then remember that Operation Christmas Child is underway for this year and we have a couple more weeks to get the funds to Maryland so that we can pay the shipping and get that taken care of.
give you praise and thanks for the way that we see you in this world. For good news that we are yet hoping to hear. For healing that you haven't worked yet. But we trust that you will. Lord, we give you thanks and praise. We give you thanks that we are able to be here this morning to worship you, to give you praise. Lord, in this season of Charge Conference, I ask, I give you thanks for leaders that say yes to serve in the ways that we ask of them. As we Try to make this your church in every way as we strive to serve you. We do continue to pray for Brock's healing. We pray for Mackenzie as she faces these tests that are important to her future career and hopes. And Lord, we give you praise for a new marriage for Adam and his spouse that they might have a long, blessed life together. And Lord, we pray for those who wait, those who are waiting for test results, those who are waiting for the right match that they might be receive a transplant and be on the path to wellness, those who are waiting for peace or for aid or help. For all the things that stop us and cause us to need to wait. Help us look to you with trust and with hope that your presence might be known in the midst of waiting. Lord, we pray for peace in our world. We pray for wisdom for leaders of groups and nations all around the world, that they might strive for your peace and your justice for every child of God there is. As we move into our election season in this country, <clears throat> we pray that you will guide us to learn how to get along with each other, how to have peace in the midst of disagreements, how to love one another, whether they think like we do or not. Forgive us in times that we have failed to do that and help us to do better. Lord, we do confess we do not always live in the ways that you would have us live, and so we ask your forgiveness. Give thanks for your grace and strive to live more as you would have us live. We praise you and thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who came to call us and challenge us to follow him with all our hearts, who died that we might have life and rose again to offer us life eternal. And so it is in his precious name that we pray. And together with the confidence of children of God, we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
course, there are many favorites if you ask Debbie's favorites. It's a long list. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Deuteronomy. We'll hear the Malachi a little bit later on. I do want to set the scene a bit because it makes better sense if you know where it is. A lot of Deuteronomy is the recounting of the law that Moses received up on the mountain as the Israelites are about to finally enter the promised land after they have been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years for a long time. I think God knows us in our human condition and we have enough educators here to know you give the directions more than once sometimes and this was important and so both in this passage then there's a little bit of shift from the recounting of the law to a giving some liturgy, some worship and ritual in ways. So this is the voice of Moses speaking to those people as they get ready to go into this new life. When you have come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance to possess, and you possess it and you settle in it, you shall take some of the first of all the fruit of the ground, which you harvest from the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you shall put it in a basket and go to the place, sorry, I lost my spot, go to the place that the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling for his name. You shall go to the priest who is in office at that time and say to him, Today I declare to the Lord your God that I have come into the land that the Lord swore to our ancestors to give us. When the priest takes the basket from your hand and sets it down before the altar of the Lord your God, you shall make this response before the Lord your God. A wandering Aramean was my ancestor. He went down into Egypt and lived there as an alien, few in number. And there he became a great nation, mighty and populous. When the Egyptians treated us harshly, and afflicted us by imposing hard labor on us. We cried to the Lord, the God of our ancestors. The Lord heard our voice and saw our affliction, our toil, and our oppression. The Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm with a terrifying display of power and with signs and wonders. And he brought us into this place and gave us this land a land flowing with milk and honey. So now I bring the first of the fruit of the ground that you, O Lord, have given me. You shall set it down before the Lord your God and bow down before the Lord your God. Then you together with the Levites and the aliens who reside among you shall celebrate with all the bounty that the Lord your God has given to you and to your house. May God add a blessing to the reading of this word. We are blessed in several ways here at Sabina United Methodist Church. One of the ones that came, comes to my mind is to host the Mothers Group. They are now called the Mom Community, the Mom Co, rather than Mops because the moms found out raising kids doesn't end when they hit preschool and kindergarten, but they need each other as they continue to raise the kids. And it's fun when I'm here to do the child care on Saturdays to walk by the room or to see the pictures on Facebook sometimes that hear the, some serious concerns or hear the laughter as they're growing and learning together and cheering together. And it's fun to watch the kids. There's some kids as old as fourth grade that like to come because they have time to just play, I think. Just be kids, not structured. And it's fun to watch some of the older ones adopt some of the younger ones and play together. And we do take the opportunity to share a Bible story and snack with them as well. It's one way we reach out into our community, reaching people younger than most of our Sunday worshipers. Your council chose to offer support to them for some to attend the annual MomCom to help them raise funds for that, although they ended up doing a lot of it on their own. 
to mom's convention and help them buy some supplies that are needed for some of their activities. We're blessed to be able to do this. We happen to be the church that manages the Sabina Area Ministerial Association Fund. Man, that's a mouthful. <laughs> and we, um, I think this price started because Joni was one of the full-time pastors in town, and it has continued here. Try to reach out and coax the other pastors into coming together again, and they just don't seem to be interested. But they still, their churches will support in some different ways, support the fund. And it is simply a fund for once a year. Someone in the Sabina area can come and say, hey, my car broke down and that was enough to push me over the line. I can't pay my water bill this month. Is there some help here? Is there, as I, we've gotten, it's been interesting working with that because at least half of the ones who have come are Mothers of children with disabilities, single mothers, or even a, one is a young adult. She's barely older than it was a cousin that she took in who had Down syndrome. And she was like 23 and took in this 19 year old special needs person. So yeah, there's help needed sometimes. Sometimes all they need is help that one month. Others, it's going to be a struggle as they go on. But it is one of the ways that we are blessed to reach out into our community. And then we're blessed through our music ministry. We have the bells this morning, the choir when they sing. And for many of us, music is one of the ways that we connect with God, whether we are part of making the music or whether we're listeners. It is one of those ways. We are blessed in many ways. And some of the ways that your generosity makes a difference right here in this place and right here in this community. God has made us and called us to be generous people. From early in our faith story, going back to that wandering Aramean and then the people escaping slavery in Egypt with God's help and being given a new land. Later, we heard a couple weeks ago about the collection for the saints in Jerusalem that was after Jesus' resurrection. There were many hundreds of years in there, and there has throughout that time been a call for the people of God to be generous towards God. So today's passage from Deuteronomy, reminding the people of how God was with them, sets God's expectations for how they will live in the new land, as well as how they will acknowledge God's generous and goodness and grace towards them. Celebrating God's goodness towards them and to us involves making a generosity towards God a priority of ours. We acknowledge that anything that we have has come from God, and we are stewards, caretakers of it. We give to God the first fruits, the first, the best of what we have received. At that time, they were a farming people, so it was the first fruits of their crops. Today, it might be that first portion of the paychecks that we receive. And as God's people were making their gifts, they were to recite a loud decree that kept them mindful of God's faithfulness over generations and generations. How God brought them out of slavery and into the land that God had promised them. Together they and the Levites, the priests, celebrate God's bounty, God's blessings poured out upon them. When we pause, even in the midst of stressful times, we look around and we realize that most of us live a life that's pretty full of blessings. We may not be wealthy in finances or things, but we do have homes. We have beloved family, friends, or church family. We live in a country where we are free to practice our faith, to vote our beliefs and attitudes, and to find health care when we need it. We are just blessed in many, many ways. When we consider how blessed we are, I hope we are moved to grow in generosity that others may feel blessed as well. 
Pastor James A. Harnish is retired from pastoring a large church. He had a long career in the Florida Conference of the United Methodist Church. He wrote a book that's called Journey to the Center of the Faith, an Explorer's Guide to Christian Living, which I believe he wrote basically for their membership classes. I've heard him speak a couple of different times, and I have come to find that he is a voice that is worth listening to. He always has wisdom to share. In this book, one of his chapters is called Generously Living, Getting the Title Clear. He's reminding his readers that God has the title to everything that we might want to think that we own. And he shares what he learned from a workshop led by a pastor named John Ortberg. He's a writer as well. You might have seen his books. He calls it the wallet experiment. He invites his listeners, readers, to take out your wallet or your purse, ladies, depending on how you do it. Look at what's in there. What does it reveal to you? Do you carry a photo of someone beloved to you? My mother had her purse stolen. It's been many years ago now. And the thing that, other than just the stress of having to replace everything and all, the thing that really hurt her was she had a wallet-sized wedding photo of her and my dad. But I think it was the only particular, only picture she had of that particular photo, only, only copy of that particular photo. And so if she opened her wallet, she would see it, and her family was important to her. She probably pictures my brother and I in there too, but she had other copies of those. Jim Harnish says he's got, he opened his wallet, he's got a photo of his wife and daughters. And as he was encouraged to go through, he saw his driver's license, which is the picture ID that we need for life in this country these days. It's used not just to drive, but for our identification. He also carries his voter registration card, which we don't need to do in this state necessarily, but we do have them. He says he's an active member of a democracy. His health insurance card reminds him that he needs to take care of his health. It's a gift from God. It's not just something to take for granted. And then he said he gets to his credit cards. And at the time the book was published, it was 2001. At that time, 1.1 billion credit cards were issued to consumers in these United States of ours. And then at the back of his wallet is some cash. He shares that he feels insecure and vulnerable without having some cash on him. How many of you were taught never to leave home without at least a certain amount of, I know I was, in case of an emergency or something, have at least this much with you. It was a dime when I was young, you make an emergency phone call, then it was a quarter, and now it's a whole different time and entirely. And then, part of the experiment, and he's in a room full of preachers, John Mark Berg says, hand your wallet to your neighbor. And then he said to kind of make them think and to make them chuckle. Now give as you believe people should give, now that they were holding your neighbor's wallet. He said he had to admit he was pretty uneasy when someone else had their hands on his wallet. It was eye-opening as he considered what his wallet said about him. So considering our wallets raises the question of ownership. Who really owns the things that we treasure? Who owns our lives? Who owns our time? Who owns our careers, our relationship, our loyalties, our money? Who owns them? And then being raised in a family, love baseball, I had to go ahead and share this next story with you, and we'll see if I can get this name out right. I've heard it, and it's just been a long time. Joe... Garagiola, something like that, was a ball player that became a sportscaster. <laughs> you may have to come, may have to help me get this out. I was stuttering and I said, no, I've heard it, but I can't get it to flow. It was back in the days when San Musio was playing pro baseball and he could hit everything and hit it out of the park. Joe was apparently the catcher against an important game against St. Louis 
And he was catching and he signaled to his pitcher to throw a fastball. Pitcher didn't want to throw a fastball. Okay, he gave him the sign for a curveball. Throw a curveball. Pitcher shook that off. He went through a couple more. No. No. I went out to the mound. And you can hear probably being a little grumpy when they even said, I've called every pitch in the book. What do you want to throw? The pitcher said, nothing. I just want to hold on to this thing as long as I can. <laughs> he was so sure that San Musial would hit whatever he threw. He was afraid to, to throw it. Our culture, our world conditions us to hold on to things. Sometimes it's to keep them safe. Sometimes it's just to hold on to them for our security or safety, whatever. Our God says, though, they aren't yours anyway. I have trusted them to you. Remember that you wouldn't have anything if I hadn't given you life, chosen you to be my people, led you out of slavery into freedom. Trust me. God says, by sharing generously the first portion of the things that you have been blessed with. If we've read the Bible, we know as the people moved into the Holy Land, the Promised Land, things didn't, and Lord help us, still aren't going smoothly there. There were already people living there. There were temptations to worship other gods. There were human power struggles. All those things that lead us away from keeping God as our priority and giving generously to God. So it'd be a few hundred years later, the prophet Malachi spoke God's word to God's people. They had not obeyed God's words and there was a particular beef God had with them in this passage. Hear these words from Malachi 3, 6 through 12. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, have not perished. Ever since the days of your ancestors, you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Will anyone rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how are we robbing you? In your tithes and offerings, you are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, so that there may be food in my house, and thus put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. See if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down an overflowing blessing. I will rebuke the locust for you so that it will not destroy the produce of your soil, and your vine in the field shall not be barren, says the Lord of hosts. Then all nations will count you happy, for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. God reminds the people that because God hasn't changed, God's steadfast covenant and promises to them are the only thing that has kept them alive and as a people of God. They have struggled to be faithful. In the back and forth, God reminds the people they are too tithe to give a tenth of their harvest and finances back to God. And yet God offers them a promise that when they will just do so, God will pour down overflowing blessings from heaven. Their crops will be protected and their land will be a land of delight. Isn't that a beautiful image? A land of delight. What bountiful promises we are given when we are generous towards God. Most American Protestant churches give between 2 to 4 percent of their income to God. Many of them do not tithe. Just think how much good the Church Universal 
could do if people trusted God fully enough to tithe, to give that first 10%. As a young teacher and a maturing in my faith young adult Christian, I found a stewardship program called Consecration Sunday very eye-opening. We were given a chart. I wanted to give it to you this morning. I have copies, but I buried them somewhere. Couldn't find it. It helps us look at weekly or monthly income. I think it gives it both ways. And what we give and what percentage of our income that is. And boy, I wasn't giving very generously to God at the time when I was first given this. We were invited to not necessarily jump from if we were giving the 2% or 3% of our income to a tithe, but to at least think about moving towards it. To, to give proportionately is the term that is used to look at the proportion of your income and give that way. And so over the next several years, I began moving towards tithing, increased a little bit each year, always to pay my bills. There were times it was a little tight because I'd spend a little more or something, but I found out that as we grow in giving, it works out. And in that meantime, I received a call to become a full-time pastor and started that process. And I had a good DS and I had given basically my notice from teaching and had been saving some money, was attending seminary. I didn't know how I was going to pay for it at that point. But I knew it was what I was called to do. And... I had a district superintendent who called me and said, I have an opportunity for you to talk to a church to be a student pastor. I said, oh, wonderful. I didn't know there was such thing. I, I had probably said to him, I will look for probably a job in a church. I fear youth or education, something like that. And so this small church in Morrill, Ohio had a pap parsonage, so that certainly helped. And... I was able to take that and I made a bit of salary. It was about a third maybe of what I had been making as a full-time teacher. And we still bills, even when the church provides the parsonage, there are still bills that we have to pay, not to mention our taxes on it. And I knew if I was going to lead those people to tithing, I had to be faithful in it myself. And boy, I confess, those are some of the hardest tithe checks I've ever written in my life because it was challenging. But I was blessed with a combination of support from my home church, especially from my parents' church. I had a pastor that they had had a couple people in a row go from their congregation to seminary and were helping. And I had attended there for a good while. And so... That last one had graduated and they wanted to keep those funds in place to do that, so I benefited. Through our student day offerings, um, usually the weekend of Thanksgiving and seminaries generosity. Can't forget the bank of mom and dad. There were times of help and need a little bit to tide me over again. I was able to Learned to live on that salary, to graduate from seminary. I was one of very few people I knew who actually graduated from seminary without student debt. But a little bit to mom and dad, they don't charge interest. <laughs> but um, I do think that trusting God enough to give that tithe contributed to the way all that came together. And I invite you, as we've been talking about giving for a couple of Sundays, to consider proportionate giving. What percentage of your income do you trust God with? Maybe you can step one step closer to tithing and find out if it is manageable. Maybe you already tithe and find joy in it and in giving freely beyond the tithe. And I thank you and always for your faithfulness, whatever you give, all of you. Because together, as we strive to live as generous people, 
We are building a way for this body of Christ and Sabina United Methodist Church to keep sharing the love of God, to keep sharing the love of Christ by touching the lives around us. And so just to be a little prayerful about it as we, oh my gosh, we're in the time we're starting to think towards the new year already. And think, is God calling you to give a bit more? And thank you for the ways that you do so already by bringing the candy to the Operation Christmas Child, to the various other ways that we give. And may you find that God pours out the blessings, not just in money, but the blessings upon all of your life. Go in peace.